So switching to the small feedlot plan uh, that uh, Iowa State University is working on, kind of uh, why why would we mess with small feedlot information in Iowa? Uh, we saw Tuesday uh, maps of the feedlot belt, the cattle belt, which kind of went from the Panhandle up into Colorado, into the panhandle of Nebraska. Uh, we're not in that panhandle of big cattle numbers, but this map shows the cattle operations. This is not cattle numbers, but this is the number of operations that have more than 500 cattle on feed in one spot. And you can see that eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, especially northwestern Iowa, uh, are in a hot spot for the number of operations with at least 500 cattle. We have a lot of small cattle feeding operations in eastern Nebraska and western Iowa. Uh, so it makes sense for us to focus some attention on those smaller feedlot operations. There was a, a project in Iowa uh, back around 2007 uh, or be prior to that called the Iowa Plan. This was an effort of the Department of Natural Resources to try to make sure all the permit size operations in Iowa were doing what they were supposed to do. And they used sirens and things like that to get people's attention. Uh, and that was relatively successful in getting the feedlot operators to actually think about whether they were following all the proper regulations. Uh, and the DNR then thought, well, maybe we could use a similar effort uh, to reach these smaller operations. Uh, so in 2007, they started working on organizing a small open lot project. And they uh, drew on a number of partners then to try to get all the players at the table to get everyone to agree on where we were going and what we were doing. Uh, so they had the Manure Management Action Group in there right away from the beginning, the Iowa Beef Center, which is just a, a collaboration of beef research and extension folks at Iowa State University, the Cattlemen's Association, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Natural Resources, extension folks, uh, NRCS and the Iowa Dairy Association all at the table to talk about how could we do a similar effort, get similar results for our small feedlot operators. The goal of this group was uh, to get operators to accurately assess the environmental impact of their feedlot operations on water quality and then to go a step farther after that assessment and actually make some changes uh, to reduce their impact and improve the protection of Iowa's natural resources, uh, primarily surface water resources that were being impacted by open lots. Uh, we tried to set up some committees to split up workload initially. Uh, I really think those committees have more or less uh, dissolved or all kind of conglomerated back into just one central core team working on this. Uh, the agencies uh, worked together to submit several grant applications to try to get funding to help support these activities and were successful in, in getting some funding. It took several years to get that funding, uh, but they did finally uh, reach that goal too to help support these things. Specifically, the objectives of the small feedlot plan, we wanted to educate producers to better understand the pollution potential of their feedlot, which is a huge task in Iowa because the vast majority of small livestock operations, especially the open lot beef operations and dairy lots, if you ask them, do you impact the stream just downhill from your lot, uh, they would say, no, no, uh, the runoff never gets there. Uh, and you would go out and walk the area right below their feedlot and you can follow the runoff trail all the way down the hill to the stream and they would look at it and say, hmm, well maybe I do, uh, but they just hadn't looked. Uh, it wasn't a priority for them to walk below the lots and see where the runoff was going. So that was a big goal for us. We wanted them to also train the producers to accurately assess the water pollution potential of their lot on their own so they didn't have to have someone else out there uh, to do that. Uh, we wanted to have them be able to identify appropriate measures that they might be able to take. Uh, their excuse always is, I'm just a small operation, I can't afford to do anything to uh, fix these problems. Uh, so we wanted them to be able to accurately identify what measures would be appropriate for an operation of their size in their situation. And then provide technical assistance and point them to financial assistance uh, to make sure they could follow through on plans to make improvements. Kind of our guiding principles, not 
objectives necessarily, but things we wanted to keep in mind as a team uh, is that producer economics, of course, highly important. Uh, we couldn't, we wouldn't have success if we were out there promoting things that were beyond the financial potential of the small operations to carry through. Uh, we kind of believed, in our hearts anyway, that high adoption rates of moderately effective controls would have greater impact in the end than low adoption rates of very effective controls. Uh, so we were not going to go out there and tell a 250 head beef feedlot you need a compacted line total containment basin and a hundred thousand dollar center pivot uh, because we knew they wouldn't do that uh, so we had to start working with things that we thought made sense for them to adopt even if they weren't quite as effective as some other controls uh, we did want to try to respect the partners uh, make a good faith effort to uh, achieve the goal uh, have all the partners pulling in the same direction and not starting to pull in opposite directions and point fingers of accusation as well. That, that partner over there is not really helping. Uh, they're trying to uh, undercut us, things like that. Uh, and then to do that even outside our meeting settings to make sure that all the partners were supportive of the effort and supporting each other's uh, part in this whole plan. So we had simple things like a, a self-assessment, just a paper version. Uh, it's only six pages long of self-assessment steps. It was available uh, through the Iowa Beef Center, and it's linked from the Manure Management Action Group website. Uh, not a very complicated thing. It's not a model. It's just a paper form that they can walk through below their feedlots and look at things that they're doing. Uh, as part of this evolved, the Iowa DNR had uh, permitted large CAFO open lots in Iowa, but had never permitted a medium CAFO open lot in Iowa. Uh, and it was pointed out that uh, if we were telling people, you know, you've, you've fit these criteria, you could be a medium CAFO, and they'd ask, well, what, what's required of a medium CAFO to get a permit? And, well, well, we don't know. Uh, we've never done one. Uh, so working together with this team, the DNR did eventually uh, develop criteria for open lot medium-sized CAFOs in Iowa, which was a, a good step to have in this process. Uh, they would tell you now, if you ask them, how many medium open lots have you permitted, now that you've got the criteria and we're telling people about this, uh, I think it's two right now, maybe three. Up to three now, Angie says. So, see, Angie, again, is the source of all manure-related information. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, another thing that was done as part of the small feedlot project, uh, we wanted people to assess their pollution potential, uh, but they didn't know how to measure that. So uh, the Department of Natural Resources said, well, we would be willing to provide water testing kits if someone else would distribute them. And they said, we, the DNR folks in Iowa, at least the field staff, are pretty self-aware of the reputation and image they have amongst producers in Iowa. I said, you know, we, we would provide testing kits, but no producer is going to come to a DNR field office to ask for a testing kit to test for, for water pollution. Uh, so we said, yeah, you, you're probably right. So it makes sense. We'll house those in Iowa State University Extension and Outreach offices in the counties. Uh, the DNR provides the testing kits and keeps them up to date. Uh, we check them out, and the producers uh, are asked uh, to just leave their names so we know who to contact if it doesn't come back in a, a week or a month. Uh, but as soon as they bring it back, we throw that piece of paper away so there is no track record of who has checked out the kits. Uh, no way that any regulator is going to come back and say, aha, they were wanting to check water quality, they must have a problem. And the producers uh, seem fairly comfortable with that. Uh, they haven't had a lot of use yet, but uh, the first two years we had them available, we had relatively dry years, not a lot of runoff, uh, not as much opportunity maybe for testing. We have uh, a couple of the first printed resources out of this project available now, uh, the what we call the handbooks, the manuals, uh, small open beef feedlots in Iowa producer guide. Uh, and an accompanying one, which uh, if you look at them closely, is almost identical on every page, uh, except that the term feedlot is not used because dairy producers in Iowa made it abundantly clear to us that they don't have open feedlots. 
Uh, they might have cow pens, they might have feed yards, but they don't have feedlots. So we had to write their own version with the proper terminology so they wouldn't reject the whole concept. Uh, but very similar publications. Uh, we ran through the first 2,000 copies of those in a big hurry and uh, have reprinted already on the Beef Handbook uh, because it has been very popular. Uh, goes through a, a lot of the background on how do open lots uh, impact water resources, what can you look for to try to track that, what are the options uh, to correct those kinds of situations. It's kind of an overview of this whole situation. Um, as part of the project, we wanted to have uh, this information available on the web. Uh, so one of the sub-pages of the Manure Management Action Group website, image website, is the small feedlot and dairy operations web page. And this is where we will put links to all the materials that are developed, post the things uh, that we develop, and also post links to other resources from other states that apply to small feedlots in Iowa. Angie mentioned that producers love demonstrations, uh, field days, so we included that in our plan for this to try to get it up and running, uh, especially for unfamiliar things for producers. Uh, and this is no surprise to you folks, uh, you all know that uh, field days are popular and relatively effective uh, in surveying the uh, late fall of 2012 demonstration uh, field days that we had, 90% of the participants uh, did in fact say that they increased their understanding of the impact that a feedlot can have on water resources. So that was our primary goal for the project and uh, the producers who were at the field day said, yeah, that, that helped. I understand that better now. 85% said they increased their understanding of uh, technical and financial assistance that's available, uh, which some of the other partners thought was very important. We need help getting the word out that we've got assistance for producers. And 60% said that they were more likely to install an improvement at their site after having been to the field day, seen an example, and talked to other producers and service providers. Control practices for small feedlots. Uh, one of the issues that we had in doing field days is there weren't a lot of good successful practices at small feedlots in Iowa. A lot of small feedlots had the bare minimum of control, so it was difficult to find people who had gone beyond the bare minimum to use as demonstration sites. Uh, but digging around quite a bit and doing a bit of driving, uh, we found some sites and we're still looking for a few more. Uh, so we would show things like clean water diversion, diverting roof water away from pens, uh, diverting field runoff around their feeding operations so they didn't have all this extra water moving through and flushing nutrients farther down the hill. Uh, so things like that were uh, good to demonstrate and as Kathy pointed out, uh, producers like to get together and talk about things. Uh, so that's a benefit that as an engineer, I guess I wasn't looking for in the field days. I was thinking, well, this is our chance to tell everybody all the great things about engineering controls. Uh, but it, in all honesty, that's not the primary benefit at the field day. They, they get more out of uh, looking at things and discussing amongst themselves. Uh, we'd show them uh, things about solid settling, one of the primary runoff control methods, just slow things down and at least capture some of the settleable solids to start with. And we're finding the producers have a, a lot of questions about how that works. Uh, and there were a lot of solid settling structures built below feedlots that just weren't working as well as they were intended to. Uh, and it has kind of even pushed the researchers to go back and say, maybe we need to look at how we were letting the water out of these basins. Uh, we maybe weren't designing them uh, the best way possible to get solid settling. Uh, beyond the solid settling, most feedlots were just releasing the settled effluent on down the hill. Uh, and we're working a lot now, focusing a lot of effort with these small lots on diverting that settled effluent some other direction than down the grass waterway toward the stream. Uh, small infiltration areas, vegetated treatment areas, pumping systems to move the water, those kinds of things, very uh, high interest level from the producers. But we knew we couldn't do this like a large CAFO does. We can't do it with expensive equipment. So we're using a lot of very low cost, inexpensive, simple pumping systems. Uh, and the uh, producers are finding this to be a, a challenge uh, they're, 
I think feeling like, well, here's an opportunity for me to show uh, my neighbors I can do this better uh, than uh, anybody else in the neighborhood, uh, which I think is going to help us in the long run. And then other things about uh, stockpiling solids, uh, little tricks that producers see and are willing to show off when we have a field day. Uh, things that help make their runoff control easier, uh, they seem more than happy to show to their friends and neighbors. So, bottom line, uh, some of the operators in this small category have just looked at it and said, well, if I'm going to invest money in better controls at my feedlot, I'm just going to expand the feedlot to a large CAFO size, permit it, and be done with this. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, we figure that's, that's success. If they decide the best thing to do is to expand and permit the site, uh, that's great. Others have uh, taken steps to try to eliminate their open lot discharges, stay at the small or medium size, uh, and construct enough controls that they feel comfortable they're not impacting water resources anymore. Some of them have gone so far as to close the open lots and put their cattle feeding under roof to eliminate runoff water uh, from their site. Uh, and we think any of those are okay. We're not in this to tell people what they should do. Our objective here is to make sure they make the best possible decisions with the information that uh, we have available to share with them. So uh, we let them decide which direction they want to go. We just want them to make their decision uh, based on some uh, good information, not on fear of being shut down. Uh, because of a, a violation somewhere. So, uh, as uh, I pointed out at the beginning, uh, a lot of this work now is being funded by a Section 319 grant uh, from EPA through the Department of Natural Resources in Iowa. Uh, so, uh, some good use of your hard-earned tax money coming back to Iowa, and we thank you for that. <laughs> Any uh, questions? <coughs> I'm sorry there are no big surprises there. You've all done this kind of stuff in extension before, but uh, this one, <coughs> the, the getting all the regulatory commodity group and support uh, agencies working together uh, made a big difference. We were just getting nowhere on this until all the players came together and agreed that we were all going to support this activity. Any questions? So what are your biggest barriers for implementation? Only smaller lots. Producers always think the biggest barrier is cost. Like, I can't afford to do this. Uh, until they get on the farm and start talking to somebody else who has already done something, and uh, they say, really, that, that works? Well, that didn't cost you much, did it? Uh, no, no. It doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, so, and that, I think, is, is one of the real benefits, is getting over that fear that I can't afford to capture my runoff. Uh, another one was pumping, uh, and I was as guilty as anybody of this. You know, you, when you look at the cost of a big basin and a center pivot, that's a lot of investment. Uh, and we would tell people, well, you know, can't afford to pump runoff water from a, an open lot. But we found if you don't have to lift it more than five or six feet, you can use a really cheap pump and move a lot of water with pennies of the electricity. Uh, so. Uh, that's really not as big a barrier as we once thought. And mindset is, is the other thing, just the, the mindset, I don't have to do that, so I'm not going to do it. Now the producers seem much more open to saying, well, if it helps me sleep better at night, knowing that uh, I'm not impacting the creek, uh, I might just go ahead and do that now. It's, it's becoming something they talk about anyway, uh, which I think is a huge mindset change from what it was 10 years ago. Do you, uh, any of your design criteria or manu uh, manuals address the definition of feedlots at all? Well, we, do, we tried it in the opening paragraphs, we tried to tell them what we mean by feedlot, and that's, it. when I talk to producers, it's, it's basically, if the manure, manure is accumulating here and running down the hill toward the stream, it's acting like a feedlot. I don't care what you call it. It might be in the middle of a pasture, it might be in the middle of a cornfield, but if it's accumulating manure to the point that it's running down the hill rather than staying on the ground, it's acting like a feedlot. You better treat